Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Let's give everyone a sec to file in here. The waiting room. All right, hope everyone is having a nice Pesach and not missing the bagels too much. <clears throat> okay, my name is Rachel Scheinerman, and this is My Jewish Learnings Daf Yomi Week in Review. So happy you could join us. And um, we, all our teachers were busy this week because it's the week of Pesach, so you all are stuck with me. <laughs> Now's your chance to get out. <laughs> And here's what I thought we would do. I thought I would give a little framing to talk of, to just sort of orient us, remember where we are in the very long tractate that is Yevamot. And then I thought it would be nice if um, we actually sat and read through, um, I brought three, I don't know if we'll get through them, but three sugyas together, just sort of, just sort of to, because often in the pieces that we publish, we publish little snippets um, and we don't often take time to sit and read through a full argument. So I brought three that I thought were particularly interesting today. I'm gonna ask you for some help reading. I'll ask her volunteers to do a little reading and we'll see how much we can get through. Okay, so first off, where are we? Where are we? We are in chapter four of Yivamot this week. Pages approximately, I decided 38 to 45, falls kind of in the middle of chapter four. And let me just orient us to the larger discussion that's going on. Of course, we know the rabbis take all kinds of tangents and go all kinds of places. But overall, as I see it, the, the main question of this chapter is what to do if we have what I call an oopsie leveret marriage. <laughs> What's an oopsie leveret marriage? Well, that's where a woman... Uh, her husband dies and we think that he's childless, but what we don't know is that she's actually in the very early stages of pregnancy. And so actually he does have seed, we just don't know about it. And so if she goes on to perform a leveret marriage, that's actually a real serious problem because not only is she not required to do leveret marriage, but she's actually brothers are not supposed to marry the same woman. So it's a forbidden relationship. Okay. So the, so the Gemara asks in, 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 a, throughout these pages, what, what, what do we do in this case? What if she does Chalitza? What if she goes through with the Yubum? And there are sort of three main scenarios that are discussed. So the first possibility is that she miscarries. We, she's pregnant, but with her um, past husband's child, but she miscarries. And of course, this is kind of, this, this is an emotionally tragic result because you can imagine she's lost her husband and then she finds out actually he has a child on the way and then the child is lost as well. We can imagine it's very emotionally tragic, but it, um, it turns out to be legally the most simple. Okay. And the rabbis, this one's easy, actually. Now that she's no longer pregnant, and she really is a Yivama, um, it's totally fine. And if she performed Chalitza, if she and the Yavam performed Chalitza, that is upheld. If she and the Yavam um, did Yibum, that too is upheld. So she just moves forward with her life. Okay, that's the legally easy case. Um, the more challenging case is if the pregnancy um, progresses in a healthy manner and she gives birth to her dead husband's child. And, and she has at this point either done chalitza with, the, with who we thought was the yibum, but now we know wasn't supposed to be a yibum, or she has done yibum with him, I'm sorry, the yavam, but we found out wasn't the yavam, or she has done yibum with him. Okay, if she gives birth to the husband's child that, and, and she had previously performed chalitza, then that's validated or, or Maybe it's not so much validated as it's fine, right? They, there was no real leveret bond. So the ritual to sever the leveret bond, it's, it's not a problem. Everything's okay. However, if she got married while she was pregnant with her 
former husband's child to his brother, to her Yavam, we now have a serious problem because she's now in a forbidden relationship. And the rabbis say that she may not continue in that marriage. Okay, and then there's actually a third scenario. You know, the like the joke, like you can either be pregnant or not pregnant and there's nothing in between. Well, it turns out there's something in between in this case. And the in-between is she is found to be pregnant um, when she, when, after her husband dies and we don't know, right. We don't know if it's her former husband's child or if it's the Yavam's child, that's a big headache. That's no good. That's no good for a bunch of reasons. Um, one is that we don't know if, if, if she's now in a forbidden relationship right? Because she's, she's married to the second brother and that's not allowed. And we also, and also the issues of inheritance become really confusing at that point, because we don't know whose child it is. So a lot of this, so, so a good chunk of this chapter um, deals with this third problematic scenario. And the rabbis basically say, really, we can prevent this problem. And the way to prevent this problem is, put it in the comments if you know, Right. The way to prevent in a child of unambiguous parentage is just wait, right? <laughs> just wait three months. And um, by then, after three months after the death of her husband, you will thanks, Janine, Janine put it in the comments too. You will know that um, if she is pregnant by that former husband or not. That's really the best solution. And in fact, we then have a teaching that says that actually in the case of any marriage that ends, wh whether it was um, whether it was liberate marriage, wh whether it was because a husband died childless or for any other reason she divorced or he died, they did have children for any reason, the rabbis actually expect the woman to wait three months to remarry. Um, and then as we get progress further in this in this chapter, there's a discussion of of that three month waiting period and what is her status while she is in that limbo, while she is between husbands. She's no longer married to her, the husband that died, but she's not yet married to her Yavam. We don't know if she's pregnant. We don't even know for sure if there should be boom. Uh, what's the status of her, specifically her property? And the answer is that her property is hers to control. She, she is an independent agent and she can control the property. She can sell the property. Um, but of course, this becomes complicated too, because um, if she dies during this period, what happens with the property? And it turns out that um, the property that was hers passes to any descendants she has. Suppose she had children by a husband prior to the husband that died. Her property can go to those descendants. Um, but anything that she was promised in her ketubah um, then goes to her any any heirs that her husband has. So uh, we haven't really discussed the ketubah at great length, but spoiler alert, the very short version of a ketubah is a ketubah is what is promised to a woman, what financial promises are made to her in the event that the marriage ends. So for whatever reason. Okay, Philip says, wasn't there something about waiting for 300 days? We'll see this in one of the, in one of the sugyas I'm about to bring to us. Um, yes, there's, there's if, if the woman is known to be pregnant, when the marriage ends, then she's actually supposed to wait out both the pregnancy and the nursing period with that child. And that's actually one of the sugyot that um, I brought. So maybe that's where, where we have 300 days from. But if there's something else that I'm not thinking of, please go ahead and put it in the comments. Okay, so I have three sugyas that I picked for us to, to sort of go through today and read together. Um, so I'm going to now share my screen and let me know, can you guys see this, see my, see my, see my um, Google Doc here? Um, give me a thumbs up. You're all muted. Good. Okay. I'm seeing some thumbs up. Okay. So 
let's let I, I I found the discussions under this particular Mishnah that we got on page on Doc 41 particularly interesting. So I brought three sugyot that spin out of this particular Mishnah. I'm going to start then um, with a volunteer just to read the Mishnah for us. And my colleague Ben Harris on the back, if you could, I'm going to invite people to raise hands. And Ben, if you would just unmute somebody who is who has raised their hands because they are willing to read this Mishnah for us, that would be dandy. Don't be shy. Okay, I got it. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Mishnah. A Yavama may neither perform Halitza nor enter into a leveret marriage until she has waited three months. And similarly, all other women may not be betrothed and may not marry until they have waited three months since their previous marriage ended. This applies both to virgins and non-virgins, both to divorcees and widows, and both to women who were married to their previous husbands and women who were only betrothed. Rabbi Yehuda says, the women who were married to their previous husbands may be betrothed, and the women who were only betrothed to their previous husbands may marry without waiting three months. This is true except for the betrothed women that are in the area of Judea due to the fact that the groom is familiar with her. Okay, so you can see there's already plenty to discuss in this Mishnah. You can see why we have pages of Gemara on this. Thank you so much, um, Pepita. Am I saying your name right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Pepita. I really appreciate. Um, so, so it starts the mission. You can see why the mission is here on Yavamot. It starts with this issue that if um, if she that that we have a three month waiting period to make sure she's not pregnant. But then the mission expands um, that ruling outward and says that other women also have to three, wait three months. In fact, they have to wait three months even if they were betrothed, they have to wait three months, oh my goodness, even if they were virgins, which then makes us think, well, maybe this might not be about pregnancy. It applies to divorcees, it applies to regular widows who, who aren't of hus husbands who are childless. Um, and Rabbi Yehuda then has a, a little more specificity on this. He, he, he says it only applies, um, it, it, we, we do allow women who were married previously to become betrothed in the three month window. And we do allow um, women who were betrothed to then become married in the, right? It, it, he, he adds a little bit of um, specificity to it that, that then may be in tension with the unnamed uh, authority in the beginning of the Mishnah. And then this is kind of cute. We didn't, we didn't discuss this, I don't think in the series, but the mission also says this is true, except for betrothed women in the area of Judea, due to the fact that the groom is familiar with her. This means, of course, that in Judea, the betrothed women were allowed to be sequestered with their grooms. And so we assume that they may have already slept together and she may actually already be pregnant. So that was apparently the custom in the area of Judea, but not everywhere else. Okay, so let's let's see the the Gemara does a number of things with this Mishnah. Um, the first one I brought is from is directly from the piece uh, that we published on Yivamot forty one. We talked about this. Um, we talked about this sugya uh, that was Rabbi Elliot Goldberg. He talked about this sugya in his piece, um, and it's nice and short, and and it's really kind of emotionally resonant. So I thought it would be interesting to start there. So can I have another volunteer? to read this Gemara. All right, okay. right here. The Gemara mentioned that a Yavama is supported from her deceased husband's estate. It now proceeds <clears throat> to cite a Baraita that teaches this Halakha. The sages taught a Yavama during the first three months following her husband's death, received sustenance payments from the husband's estate. This is because her previous marriage to him is the cause of her current unmarried state, since it is due to that marriage that she must first wait three months before remarrying. From this point forward, she does not receive sustenance payments, neither from the husband's estate nor from the Yavam, as he has not yet consummated a liberate marriage with her. If the Yavam was brought to judgment and it was decided that he was obligated to either consummate the liberate marriage with her or perform chalitza, and he ran away to avoid doing so, she received sustenance payments from the estate of the Yavam, 
which is his penalty for neglecting his duty. Okay, so I'll just pause you there just to editorialize and summarize, right? She, we're in the three month waiting period. Who's financially responsible for this woman? It's the Yavam. And if he tries to run away and neglect that duty, well, he's still, he's, we still chase him down for support payments, right? Okay. Um, by the way, I brought with the Steinsoltz commentary here. So that's what's going on with the bold and the non-bolded text. The bold text is sort of a direct translation from the Talmud and the interposed non-bold text is Steinzelt's commentary that makes it a little bit more readable. Sometimes, uh, usually when in, in the pieces that I publish, I don't include that commentary, but, I, but we're being a little experimental this morning. I thought we'd see how it was to read it with Steinzelt. Um, so, okay, Leah, go ahead for us. Oh, we can't hear you anymore. Yeah. Okay, got it. The Gemara asks, if she happened to, if she happened before her Yavam, who is a minor for Leveret marriage, what is the halacha? From the Yavam, she does not have any right to sustenance payments because, as a minor, he is unable to consummate a Leveret marriage. But as to payments from her husband's estate, what is the halacha? Since his death placed her in a situation that forces her to remain in an unmarried state, does his estate have to take responsibility of supporting her? Okay, Rav, so let's let's just pause here for a sec, make sure everybody's on board. Now we're in the situation where she's a she's she's been widowed, her previous husband had no child, and her Yavam is himself a child, right? Her 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 deceased husband had a much younger brother. Um, this is this is sort of the situation with Judah and Tamar, which is a story we've that's sort of a touchstone for this tractate. And so she has to wait a long time to marry him, not because we're wondering whether she's pregnant, but because he's simply not old enough to get married and he's not old enough to support her. And so the Gemara says um, that he is not required to sustain her. But what about her husband's estate? Is her husband's estate? required to sustain her all right this is the this is the question the rabbis are asking okay Leah you're doing great thank you finish us up here uh, Rav Acha and Ravina disagree with regard to this matter how can it be otherwise one one said she does have rights to sustenance payments and the other one said she does not have any rights and the halakha is that she does not have any rights to sustenance payments this is because the husband is not considered to be responsible for her situation. Rather, it is thought that she was penalized by heaven. Oi. Oi is right. This, this, got, this got Elliot upset, and that's why he wrote his piece on it. But I'm curious what you all think. We have this very long period where she is not married and and in in antiquity right a woman is mostly supported by marriage and she isn't married to her previous husband he because he's dead and she isn't married to her yavam because he's a little boy and so who is somebody responsible for supporting her right we know that the torah tells us over and over again that we're responsible for protecting the widow and the poor and the orphan and all of these people um, is somebody, is there somebody we can say is specifically responsible for this woman or not? Um, and you can see Rav Acha and Ravina disagree about whether it's the husband's state that should support her or whether nobody's responsible. I'm curious um, to see, I'm going to see in, um, sorry, let me awkwardly, where are the comments? I can't see your comments. Oh, there we go. I'm curious what you guys think about this. Let me see. Um, all right. Right. Would she go back to her father's house? Um, Susan asks. I think that is very likely what she would do if her father is alive. That, that is what Tamar does in the Bible. Of course, you can't take the Bible as a as good precedent for everything, especially since in the two cases of leveret marriage in the Bible, Judah and Tamar and Ruth and Boaz, they both don't go exactly according to the laws, um, which is probably why the rabbis actually don't discuss those cases all that much because they don't seem to be exactly following the laws of leveret marriage. Um, but what do you guys think about this idea that she was penalized by heaven? How does this language hit you? 
Okay, I see, I see some negative gestures. I can only see a few squares. So I can't see, if most of you are gesturing, I can't see. <laughs> um, so I think, I, you know, um, I, see, I see some people are upset by it. Rabbi Goldberg was upset too, and said, this is, this is, this is awful. Um, this idea that God would punish this poor woman, hasn't she been punished enough? Um, I will say that I tend to read this a little bit differently. I don't know if I'm right, but I tend to hear in this, it's not that God is punishing her. It's just that this is this is one of those things that happens and in life and life is not fair. And we it doesn't mean we can assign somebody else to take care of her. So I hear in that not quite as much negativity that God is like punishing, punishing her and more of a life is not fair sometimes kind of comment. Um, but definitely something something to something to think about and feel free to disagree with me. All right, I want to get to at least one more sugya. Um, I brought two here. I'm going to scroll. Uh, is it everyone can still see my page? I hope on Yiva Mote, um 42, we have a new question. So the previous question was if her Yavam isn't um, old enough to marry her. In this sugya, um, the quest, this, uh, this page is mostly dealing with the situation where she's known to be pregnant when 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 her husband dies right okay in all the in in the previous pages we've been talking about a lot about we don't know if she's pregnant or not and so we need to wait and this and that in this case what do we do if her husband dies and we know that she's pregnant with the child there is no child yet but there's a fetus what do we do um and so um that's sorry i'm good i'm skipping one that, that's the second discussion on this page. I think it's the more interesting one. The first discussion, which if we have time or if you want, you can look at yourself, is whether we can shorten that three month waiting window and still be sure about whose child it is, right? The, the rabbis discuss maybe it can be two months, maybe it can be a month and a half. Can we shorten it? Can we get her married right away and check later? And maybe we can figure it out. And after a whole um, dizzying conversation about it, they determine, yeah, three months is really required. But I'm going to skip us forward because I can see we're running low on time. The question now is we know she's pregnant. And so the question is, if we know she's pregnant, right, her husband's dead, she's pregnant. Why wait to remarry? Can she remarry right away? This is no longer leveret marriage necessarily because we know that she's pregnant with her husband's child. But this is more to the larger question. Remember, in the mission of the rabbi said that anybody has to wait three months after their marriage. And, it, and if she's pregnant, she has to wait all the way till she's weaned that baby. Why? Why can't she just get remarried? Especially knowing that remarriage can uh, is, is really essential to providing financial support for this woman. Why do we make her wait? So I would love another volunteer. We'll pick up um, with this sugya. Someone raise your hand, Ben, call on somebody. And we will we will read this one together. Not seeing any raised hands. No, you guys are going to make me do it. Oh, Pepita says she'll do it again. So Gamara asks, in cases where we're convinced that she's pregnant, let her marry immediately as the reason to wait three months doesn't apply. Why then is it taught in a baraita a man must not marry a woman who is pregnant with the child of another man? nor a woman who's nursing the child of another man. And if he transgressed and married her, he's penalized for violating the prohibition and he must divorce her and may never take her back. Should I go on? Yes, go ahead. Let's, Mara let's explains, this prohibition is a rabbinic decree lest she become pregnant a second time and her original fetus be deformed in the shape of a sandal fish. Okay, I'll offer a, a, a little comment here. <clears throat> the reason she can't get married again while she's pregnant is we're worried that her second husband will also um, inseminate her. And now she will have two twins by two different fathers in her husband of different gestational ages. And the second twin by the second husband is going to endanger the first twin and that fetus is not going to make it. And this is a common rabbinic locution for, for a fetus that doesn't, that doesn't make it, that, that is stillborn and, and comes out, they say, looking like a sandal fish. Um, okay, so that's the concern. That maybe this is the reason we don't allow her to remarry. 
Okay, Pepita, let's see what the Gemara says about that. The Gemara asks, if so, even if his wife is pregnant with his own child, the same concern applies. The right. Gemara's right. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm just going to pause and talk here. <laughs> right. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a new husband. This, this weird phenomenon, which by the way, has a term, it's called superfetation. When you have two, two babies in the womb who are not conceived at the same time, by the way, it is, I looked this up. It is super, super rare. And I think it probably was not as likely as the rabbis thought it was. I think what they were probably seeing that made them think that this was happening was twins where one did not survive and therefore was born, still born at a different gestational age. And so it looked to them like this might've happened. But as far as I can tell in the last century, there've only been 12 cases worldwide of superfetation. So it's not very common. But the point here is the husband, even if she doesn't, he doesn't die, like she could, he could impregnate her a second time and we'd have the same concern about the danger to the first fetus. So that Gemara, doesn't really make sense. Thank you, Pepita. Go ahead. The Gemara responds, she's permitted to engage in relations both if one holds in accordance with the one who said that a young girl for whom it is dangerous to become pregnant is permitted to engage in relations using a contraceptive resorbent placed at the entrance to her womb. Then also a woman pregnant with her husband's child may engage in relations using a resorbent. And similarly, if one holds in accordance with the one who said a young girl is permitted to engage in relations in her usual manner, and heaven will have mercy upon her and prevent any mishap, then in this case as well, a pregnant woman should continue to engage in relations and heaven will have mercy upon her. Okay, so we, we learn, we're, we're drawing an analogy to the case of a young girl who's having relations and we don't want her to become pregnant because we're worried that a pregnancy at her young age would endanger her health. And some rabbis think the solution to this, I'm gonna skip all over all the moral stuff. I think they think the solution to this is to use birth control, right? And then prevent her from getting pregnant. And other rabbis think that the solution is, don't worry, God will prevent her from becoming pregnant and have mercy on her. And they say, whether you hold by one or the other, the same would apply in this case with the woman who is pregnant and on her second marriage. God will prevent the second pregnancy, if that's what you think, or she can use a resorbent, if that's what you think. Okay? All right, so this doesn't, this, this is not a good reason why she shouldn't be able to remarry. Okay, let's continue. The Gemara objects, but here too, in the case of a woman who's pregnant with a child of another man, these solutions could be employed, both if one holds in accordance with the one who says that a young girl may engage in relations using a resorbent, in this case as well, she may do so using a resorbent. And similarly, if one holds in accordance with the one who says that heaven will have mercy upon her, in this case as well, heaven will have mercy upon her. Okay, that's what I was just saying. Let's keep going. The Gemara suggests a different reason for the prohibition against marrying a woman who's pregnant with the child of another man. Rather, it is due to the damage that could be caused to the fetus by the pressure applied to it at the time of intercourse. The Gemara asks, if so, even if his wife is pregnant with his own child, the same concern applies. The Gemara explains, when it is his own child, he has mercy upon it and tries not to apply too much pressure. The Gemara asks, but here too, when it is the child of another man, he will have mercy upon it, as certainly one is careful not to cause harm to any human life and will be careful not to press down too hard. Okay, so this is a common pregnancy myth. In fact, I remember when I was pregnant, I got a brochure that mentioned this, right? This idea that intercourse while pregnant will somehow be dangerous to the fetus. It's not, but the rabbis worry that it is if it's done too roughly. And then they, and then this is to me really interesting. They worry whether the, the man will be gentle to protect this fetus. And there's a concern that if he knows it's not his child, he won't be gentle, right? There's, a, there's this initial concern that he's not gonna care about the life of this child since it's not his, this, this fetus. And then, there's, um, and then there's counterpoint that's a little more optimistic about the nature of men, which says that actually he will. Okay, we, even though it's not his child, he's not that much of a, can't say that word on air. Okay, so let's keep going. So Gamara suggests a different reason. Rather, the reason for the prohibition is that a typical pregnant woman is poised to nurse her child once it is born. Therefore, one should not 
one should be concerned that perhaps she will become pregnant and her milk will dry up during pregnancy and the lack of milk will kill her newborn child. The Gemara asks, if so, even if his wife is pregnant with his own child, the same concern applies. The Gemara explains for his own child, she will feed him with eggs and milk as a substitute for the mother's milk. The Gemara asks, even if the child is not his, it is still the mother's child and for her child, she will also feed him with eggs and milk. The Gemara answers, the husband will not give her money to procure food for a child that is not his. The Gemara asks, but she could sue her first husband's heirs to provide subsistence for the child. Abai says, a woman is embarrassed to come to court and therefore she will not obtain enough sustenance for him. Consequently, she effectively kills her son as a result. And so, yeah. Okay, this is the third suggestion for why a pregnant woman can't get remarried. Now we're not worried about her during the pregnancy, but we're worried about her post-pregnancy. Now she's nursing and we're worried she'll get pregnant again. And that will um, threaten the milk supply, which is, there is some truth in that. The hormones of pregnancy, I looked this all up too, can reduce um, the milk supply. And in a world where there isn't formula you can buy off the shelf, this is actually dangerous to the baby. Right. And the Gemara again points out, well, what does this have to do with a second marriage? She could she could be married to the same guy and get pregnant again really quickly. And we'd have the same concern about the milk supply. And the answer is, well, if, if it's the same children of the same father, we trust him to feed the child with the ancient equivalent of formula, which is this concoction of milk and eggs that will be a substitute for the mother's milk. Um, but if it's not his child, we're concerned that he will not provide the money. Okay, and here, uh, unlike in the case with the intercourse, the penetrative intercourse that we're worried, and the Gemara suggests maybe he'll be gentle, there is less uh, of a counter voice here that says maybe the husband will have mercy on this baby and buy it eggs and milk. Um, and and then the Gemara, and instead the Gemara says, well, surely the mother will find a way to sustain this first baby of the dead husband, she could sue the dead husband's relatives or she could ask in court and ask them to sustain the baby's life. And the uh, Abaya says, and I don't really know entirely what to make of this, a woman is embarrassed to come to court, right? She's apparently, I, I don't know, she's gonna be so nervous to come to court that she, uh, and, and, and I feel like there's a lot going on behind here that I don't fully understand. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts. And effectively, she will kill her child because she will not get the sustenance that child needs. It's it's all very dark view of human nature here, I think. And and I and I thought about this a lot because I I wrote the page on this on this piece, and I was asking myself, is it is it that human beings are really dark, or are we just um, are we just preparing for the most dark human beings here, or or is it that in antiquity? Um, there's a really different attitude toward children and a lot less attachment and affection because uh, there's a lot of evidence for that too. I'm not really sure. So anyway, I see that we're a few minutes over time and I don't want to keep people around. Uh, I know people have things to do and places to go, but if you, if you want to offer a few comments, if anyone has a burning comment um, to, to, to share with the group, I'd love to hear it. Um, now I'm going to scan the comments. It's hard for me to do that while I'm talking. Uh huh. Abaya doesn't know my ex-wife. <laughs> That's a great one. Um, they assume that the husband's relatives care so little about their grandchild. Yeah. Well, let me offer a counterpoint to that because I don't know. This is complicated. There's a lot of uh, um. But uh, another point could be, you know, this is a world where food resources can be really, really limited, right? To us, the idea of denying a baby milk and eggs, what in like, what? But but in antiquity where starvation was common, where food was, could in a lean season could be scarce, you could understand why like, no, actually it's my baby that needs those milk and eggs and there isn't enough to go around, right? That could be another um, scenario here. Um, and yes, Janine says it's also a dark view of the community not feeling enough responsibility for widows and children. Absolutely, which is, I think, indeed why the Torah just hammers away at that, and the prophets too, hammers away at that. Like, you have to care for the widows and children in your midst. You have to, 
um, there's no one specifically legally assigned to them and they can be in real danger. And we really see that in this sugya. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what is the, what about the differences in response to a girl child versus a boy child? Doesn't say anything here. Doesn't say anything differently. Um, in today's staff, it seemed to be some question about supporting women. I wondered about the reason on matrilineal descent. Uh, Janine, I'm not sure if I've quite got your question, but um, uh, yes, Judaism passes through the matrilineal line. It does probably, honestly, because that's how Roman law worked in the period. And the rabbis are, are living in a system where, where um, religion has passed through the, through the mother's line. If you look at the Torah, it always goes through the father. So it prob that's probably the reason. Um, all right, yes. And some Jews follow patrilineal descent in addition to matrilineal descent, especially the reform movement has looked to reclaim that. Um, okay, I think we're gonna leave it there because I see I'm seven minutes over. Um, thank you everybody for joining me and for playing ball with a different format. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the format, whether you thought this was a good format or a not good format, you can always email me. Um, I'll put my email address down here. Um, you can email me directly. It's rshinerman at myjewishlearning.com. And the other way to get through to us is community at myjewishlearning.com. Um, please do tell us. And um, it was really nice to see you all. Thank you for the help with the reading. And we will see you next week and also tomorrow in your inbox. Okay, bye everyone.